Hi, my name is Laura. I am director and owner of VatNav Limited. Now today in what is our second YouTube video, we're gonna go through VAT for service department operators. Um, now it's an area we got into a little bit by accident in that um, TOMS, which is an area that we specialize in, can apply and can be a really good thing for service department operators, but it's by no means the only thing that um, needs to be considered. So today we're going to talk through a number of areas of VAT, um, which were really useful for operator, operators to consider to make sure your position is both correct, um, but also optimal. So if we can get the, um, the screen sharing to work. Here we go. Um, so we're going to split this into sales and output VAT, um, the position and then purchases and your input VAT for operators. So there's several different types of output VAT positions that we may have as a service department operator. First one is standard rated VAT, uh, what we call normal VAT. Um, the second one is the reduced long stay VAT, which a lot of people call the 4% rate. Um, we'll talk about why that's called that in a bit more detail later on. Um, the third possibility is exempt, um, which is a no VAT, as it, as it may suggest. Um, and the fourth one is the TOMS position, which is still standard rated VAT, but it's payable on the margin only. Now, sometimes there's no choice as to which one we have to use. Other times we can actually look at, you know, a couple of grey areas to move us into the most optimal position. Now, the first question that we need to ask ourselves before we get to the rates is, are we operating as principal or agent? Now, this may seem a, a sort of slightly odd point, um, but if we don't own the property, we can act in either capacity. Um, as an operator, we could be, um, and many people use this term interchangeably. Um, some people say I'm a managing agent um, and I'm an operator and, and they mean slightly different things by it. Now, it is actually a very subtle difference in practice. Um, and what we're really talking about is contractually, are you buying and selling accommodation or are you arranging for someone else, normally a landlord, to have a contract with someone else, um, a guest or, or other business. Um, it can be a very similar position in practice, um, but we're really looking to, to decide contractually what are you actually doing. Um, now, this may hopefully sort of uh, shed a bit of light on, on how similar the two positions uh, can look. But if we say, if we look at this diagram here, uh, the, the pink arrows are the exchange of money. Now, in this case, we're acting as a principal. And here we're passing £130 to the service department operator and the operator is passing £100 to the landlord. Great. The blue arrows here is the contractual position. Now, here we've got a contract between the landlord and the service department operators. The landlord is selling the accommodation to the operator for £100 and he gets the money in exchange for that. Now, the service department operator has another contract for the sale of accommodation to the individual for £130. So that sounds quite simple. And that's a position for a lot of cases. Normally, we would classify these as, a, as, a, as an operator rather than an agent, um, because in this case, the operators themselves buying and selling the accommodation contractually. Now, if we look at the position as an agent, you can see here that practically um, the position is, is very similar in that we still have a guest here paying £130 to the, now we're going to call it a managing agent. And the managing agent is still passing £100 to the landlord. But the difference here is that isn't the same with the contractual arrangements. Because here we've got a contract between the landlord and the guest for £130. So we know that the guest has to pay someone £130. He's just paying the managing agent on behalf of the landlord. And the landlord um, is, is entitled to receive that £130 in full. Um, however, he has a separate contract with the managing agent for intermediary services. So these are the services from the managing agent. The managing agent isn't buying and selling accommodation. They're literally just giving them a service of agency or intermediary. So they're earning a fee or a commission for arranging um, the property, maybe dealing with um, I don't know, various 
complications and complaints and uh, whatever else may may happen. Um, but uh, I'm sure doing a very valuable job. Don't ever let me <laughs> say otherwise. Um, so when I say just being a managing agent, I don't mean that it's you know a, a sort of lesser position. It's it's more that um, contractually we're not taking on the accommodation responsibility itself. Um, so here what we've got is a situation that looks very, very similar in practice um, to principle. The, the payment position isn't really, I guess, important for that purposes. What's important is who is contractually um, assigned to do what. And in this situation, we have the landlord supplying the accommodation directly to the person. It's just that everything is going through the managing agent and they are receiving a fee in return for that. Um, now, normally we would need to review contracts to, um, to ascertain which of these two positions applies. Um, it's sometimes optimal to act as agent. It's sometimes optimal to act as principal. Often we can get to that position by making sure the contracts um, and, and obviously the practical reality reflects that. Um, because these two positions are so subtly different, um, it is an area that we can often optimize. Now, in terms of the VAT position for agents, um, sorry, this slide is quite lengthy, um, but, um, one of the good things about acting as agent is that the um, the, the VAT uh, accounting value is the commission or fee only. The agent doesn't have to think about accounting for VAT on the accommodation itself. The the actual, um, if we go back, the, the accommodation services with price 130 at the bottom of the page, that transaction is completely up to the landlord in terms of how they're going to account for VAT. They are the principal in that transaction. The agent only has to worry about accounting for VAT on this £30 fee there. The other thing as well is if you're just starting out um, is as agent, when we're going towards the VAT registration threshold, the £85,000, we're only looking at those fees and not the full amount of turnover. Now, in terms of the actual agency fee itself, um, there's a couple of questions to ask ourselves to make sure we get to the right amount. So firstly, who is the customer? Is your customer a business or is it a, an individual? If the landlord or someone else, some other business is paying the commission, they are the customer, even though, you know, you may refer to them as your supplier um, for the agency fee that you're paying them and um, that you're getting paid by them, sorry, um, for your services of arranging the accommodation. Um, they are your customer because you're providing a service to them. So if that's the case, um, commissions are subject to what we call the general place of supply rule. That means that if your business customer is located in the UK, we have to look at UK VAT. If your business customer is located outside the UK or normally resides outside the UK, that's the end of it. We don't have to account for any VAT on that particular fee. If, however, your customer is the guest, so say that you receive a commission from the guest in order for finding them a property, um, we need to think about where the um, where the property is located. Um, that means that if the property is located in the UK, we're looking at charging 20% VAT um, on the fee, regardless of where the, um, the guest is located themselves. So... Um, it, it can mean that if we have um, a little bit of an international aspect, it may actually be that acting as agent does give a much better position than anything um, if it actually means that um, VAT doesn't have to be paid. Um, obviously, you need to follow the rules, though. So if you um, if your commissions are paid to UK businesses um, or relating to UK properties um, for, for those that are sold B2C, um, then obviously you will have to think about UK VAT, but again, only on the commission and not the full value of the accommodation. So in some cases, this can be a really good way for, for everyone to pay um, a bit less VAT overall. Um, it does obviously mean certain restrictions um, in terms of your uh, contractual arrangements. Um, um, and may not work for all, but it's definitely something to discuss. Now, in, in, in um, comparison to that, the VAT position for principles, um, we're normally, if we're looking at UK property, we're looking at a UK VAT charge. There's no real other place of supply um, for, for services as principal. So if we have um, UK property, we need to look at UK VAT for principal transactions. That is the supply of the accommodation itself. 
um, regardless. So when I say principal, it could be the owner, but it could also be the operator. So if the if the owner of the property sells to the operator and the operator sells on as principal, um, then they're all acting. They're both acting as principal. If the property is a UK accommodation, both the landlord and the operator need to consider their UK VAT position. So. The first question really we're asking ourselves for transactions as principal is, is the property residential or is it instead tourist accommodation? Um, UK residential property is normally exempt from VAT. That's um, normally because the, um, in general, the default rule for land is that it's exempt from VAT. Um, but there is an exception for UK tourist accommodation. Um, and this means it's typically subject to um, the standard rate of VAT, unless one of the exceptions that we'll talk about apply. Um, so I think the first question here, we need to think about, is our property exempt or taxable? Because this is really important both for output VAT and for input VAT. So I guess what is the difference? In, in some cases, it can be a grey area. Normally, it's... Um, it can be, well, say normally, it, it can be quite obvious where something is residential. Um, you may have a sort of year or two year AST style contract. Um, it's the occupier's primary or only address. Um, and they sort of pay their own bills, their own council tax, etc. And you have very limited involvement. As the contrast, um, tourist uh, accommodation can be quite obvious. Someone st stays for a week somewhere. Um, you advertise on, you know, booking.com, Airbnb for short term um, holiday apartments. Um, you provide everything, you provide sort of cleaning, linen changes, etc. No one has to cover any bills um, and the occupier has their own address somewhere else. Um, now, those situations, it can be quite straightforward to decide who's who. Um, but there are certain situations where it's a bit grey. So what happens, for example, if someone stays three months or if someone doesn't actually have another address, they maybe have stayed in that property while they're waiting for um, their house to be completed. And it may be sort of, you know, two weeks. Is that short enough or there's no time limit particularly? So it could be someone could be on a, a sort of holiday let tourist accommodation style property for six to nine months, say, um, you know, we talk a lot um, in, in the courts about um, student accommodation, um, secondees, contractors, etc. There is a grey area. So this is something there again, it is grey. In one case, it's a bit of a pain, but in other cases, it gives us the advantage of being able to argue or try and argue the best case for based on what you want. Do you want it to be exempt? Do you want it to be taxable? We can try and argue either way. Um, so it can be good. Grey is not always bad. Um, so in terms of the output that, that position, um, where we've got accommodation that is for tourists, um, services are typically subject to the standard rate of VAT um, or another exception, as we'll go on to see. Um, so the full value of the accommodation here counts towards the registration threshold. Um, the output VAT charged um, goes into your output VAT and net sales goes into box six of your return. Um, in contrast, where accommodation is residential, it is exempt from UK VAT, um, doesn't count towards the VAT registration threshold. And if all you do is sell um, residential accommodation, you're not actually permitted to register for UK VAT. Um, if you have some taxable services, um, you could register, uh, don't, that don't meet the 85,000 threshold, you could register um, voluntarily. Most don't choose to do so because it's not beneficial, but it's another question that we often um, consider in our consultations is should someone register before they need to, because um, sometimes it can be beneficial. Um, but anyway, for, for exempt uh, stuff, it doesn't count towards the reg registration threshold. Um, there's no VAT to declare for exempt residential sales. Um, there are restrictions to input VAT recovery, which we will discuss later, um, but it is um, a lot of people sort of think, oh, great, you know, we've got residential accommodation. That's fantastic. We don't need to consider anything further. Um, but it does mean that if we have um, a large amount of purchases, um, capital items, refurbs, it does mean that that is a consideration. Um, so we do need to think about that. So it's it's not all a fantastic position, um, but it's something to, to consider further. So that's the standard rate, which uh, for tourist accommodation is the, the regular rate to um, reply. Um, 
the other sort of schemes, I guess, that are available that could help you out um, are this long stay 4% rate, um, which applies if you're owning and or renting. The flat rate scheme, again, applies if you're owning or renting. And then the tour operators margin scheme, the TOM scheme, it can't apply um, if, you're owning the pro- if you own the property. It can sometimes occasionally apply if you're renting the property, but with all due care. Um, we do have another video um, entirely on the TOM scheme, so we're not going to go into it into a lot of detail here, um, but please do check out our other video on this scheme, which explains it in a lot of depth, probably more depth than most people ever ever want to see. Um, But yeah, it is there. So please do check it out. Um, So the the long stay rule, um, all it is, and I think people refer to it as a 4% rate, um, it it can apply regardless of whether you own the property or you're um, doing art or anything else, um, as long as you're acting as principal. And it applies when the room's been occupied by the same guest for more than 28 days. Um, And it applies from the 29th day onwards. Um, The customer, I think some people will say, oh, if I've just got the same business renting from me, can I use it? So, well, you need to have a sort of a fair idea that it's um, being occupied by the same person or the same lead person so it could be that you don't know you know you rent it out um, to a group of contractors and it may be that you don't know whether someone's always in the property you need to have a sort of fair idea that they're going to be there um, you can't sort of just rent it to a company who may have different people in and out every week um, contracting and their own staff um, you obviously don't have to go and audit it every week, but you need to sort of have some sort of reassurance, such as somewhere sort of signed uh, contract to say that the same person or the same lead people uh, lead, lead people are going to be there. Um, but anyway, once you've got that, um, you can apply the relief from day 29 onwards. So how that works may be as follows. Let's say you've agreed a weekly gross rate, six hundred pounds. Um, may I would I would normally say you would you should either be silent on the VAT on this point, or it should be taken to be VAT inclusive. Um, and we've got thirty five nights stay. So the first four weeks, um, we've got gross rate of six hundred. The first four weeks are charged at twenty percent uh, VAT, so it's five hundred plus one hundred VAT to give us six hundred. After that, twenty eight days are over. The next week, we're still charging £600, but now we're only paying that at what we call the, the 4% rate. Um, so instead of paying it, um, we, we say we take it uh, as um, the VAT rate as 4 over 104 um, to, to give us the, the VAT out of a gross amount. Um, so now we've got a net of 576 and VAT of 23. So you've just earned yourself an extra six, £76 worth of profit. Um I would note that if you if you agreed it with the customer as five hundred pounds plus fat, you can't then do what we've done in that example in the fifth week. You would then have to do five hundred pounds plus four percent VAT. Um, so yes, yeah, and the key here is if you've got a grace rate that doesn't change, um, then you do sort of earn a, a profit of sorts uh, on that rate. Um, the next relief that is. A good one to um, think about is a flat rate scheme. Um, Now, this is available for businesses supplying tourist accommodation, regardless of whether you own it or do R to R or whatever else. Your turnover must be 150 grand or less when you join the scheme. Um, You must leave when your turnover goes over 230K. um, And you do need to get approval from HMRC to use this in advance. and what this means is it, the whole idea of it is to simplify accounting, but let's be honest, most people use it because it gives a vast advantage in a lot of cases. Um, what happens is that you don't pay 20% on every single sale and recover all your VAT on every single purchase. What you do is you pay over to HMRC just a set percentage um, of your sales and you don't recover any input VAT. So it varies from sector to sector, but for service department accommodation, which is in the sort of hotel and and similar accommodation section, it's 10.5%. So this means that you um, you pay 10.5% in um, output VAT and you don't recover any input VAT. There is an exception to this. And this is for proper, for businesses that are classified as limited cost traders. Um, in that case, it basically means that, and, and um, you need to have a look uh, in detail at, at the rules to this, but 
it basically means that you don't really buy that many goods in your business. Um, there are specific limits that need to be looked into um, for everyone. Um, but if you fall to be a limited cost trader, your percentage goes up to 16.5 and it's probably not worth doing it. Um, but assuming that you don't fall into that definition, um, the 10.5% rate is, um, is for you and it normally um, works out more beneficial. So this is an example here. Um, let's say we've got gross sales of 120K. Um, and purchases of 54k and we put plus 4k of um, VAT of input VAT and purchases and obviously that's not 20% of 54 but we're assuming for the service department sector that you know many purchases are non-vatable for example if you're renting from a landlord that's not vatable if you're um, you know, incurring costs from building it can be zero rated um, you may also incur costs from non-VAT registered uh, parties so let's just sort of say, you know, loosely speaking, we've got, I don't know, about 8% of that on our purchases, so about 4K. Under the normal VAT rules, um, we would pay um, 20,000 VAT on our sales, which is basically just the gross sales of 120. It's just 100 plus 20% VAT. Um, and our VAT recovery, we're recovering all our input VAT on purchases, which gives us a net position of 16,000 payable to HMRC. Under the flat rate scheme, we are paying um, £11,402.71 on our sales, um, which is basically just 120 gross, and we're carving out the VAT by doing 10.5 over 110.5. Now, we can't recover any VAT on our purchases, but our net VAT position then is a payment to HMRC of 11000 As a typo, it should be 11402 Pound seventy-one. So you can see there in this case that we've got quite a good advantage um, from using the flat rate scheme. Now it does depend on the numbers. If you would ordinarily be having purchases with a lot more input VAT than that, um, it may not be the best course of action for you. Um, but it's something that definitely should be looked at if you're falling around those turnover figures. Now the third um, of, of the sort of possible options uh, to, to optimise out of that is the TOMS rules. Um, now, as I said, we're not going to go into this in much detail. Please do re, uh, to look at the other video on TOMS, um, which takes us through everything. Um, but loosely speaking, I think the first thing is you can only use TOMS um, if you're buying in the accommodation from a third party. Um, and when they apply that, the rules must be used compulsorily. The challenge is that for many service department operators, they don't um, apply because one of the conditions for the TOMS rules is that when you take the, uh, the take the accommodation in, you can't materially alter um, the accommodation. And what that means is if we go here, um, material alteration is a big thing for service department operators. And one thing that we've been quite frustrated with is that HMRC haven't really been very clear on what they mean uh, by material alteration and that there's very little guidance on it. But if you take a case to HMRC, they'll say, oh, no, we think this is material alteration or we think that is material operation. We're like, where is this in your guidance? It's nowhere. So it's very, diff very difficult to, um, to sort of argue either way with HMRC. There is a case currently going through the courts that we're hoping to get the outcome of soon, which may give us a bit more certainty um, about this position. But basically, um, in order to qualify for TOMS, businesses must not materially alter the service. So this normally means that the, the apartment must be furnished by not you. Um, you should add very little to the apartment. Um, and you shouldn't yourself do anything which is key to the overall supply. So for example, I don't know if you have a, um, a set of accommodation and you maybe provide like a breakfast service alongside it that would be something that would be key to the sort of bed and breakfast supply it doesn't mean that you have to that someone else has to provide them with a breakfast but if you're doing that it shows that you're enhancing the accommodation that's materially altering um you shouldn't be responsible for any major works or maintenance to the building hmrc's guidance just talks about the fabric of the building but we know in reality they mean pretty much any building work or maintenance um there should be very little engagement between your staff and the occupiers. Um, so staff shouldn't be sort of on site managing it, um, you know, um, coming and, and doing loads of things for the um, occupiers. Um, and one of the key points that's been looked at in the in the court case that's currently pending is 
the lease duration it shouldn't be um it shouldn't be a long lease between you and the landlord or the person who is selling the apartment to you so a lot of people we see have you know five years um leases with landlords and then converting it into like a week's stay for each individual guest HMRC have said the duration between five years into a week is too much. So there's various things and it's different for everyone. Sometimes we've been able to make it work um, for people and it is beneficial, but it's something that I would suggest if you're looking into Tom's, do give us a call. Um, we do lots of consultations for service department operators and we'd always suggest this to make sure that everything is set up correctly and that you don't have any risk to yourself. So the effect of TOMS, just to sort of briefly take you through it, is that firstly, only the margin counts towards the registration threshold. The margin being the gross, sell gross selling price um, based on check-ins within that period and um, the gross cost being um, basically the cost of the rent from the landlord or the whoever's selling it to you, um, plus various other incidental costs. Um, that would take as the margin, and it's only that that counts towards the re registration threshold. Um, standard rated VAT is due, but on the direct margin made only rather than the full selling price. You can't recover any input VAT on direct costs. So basically that is the, the, the direct cost being the rent and the various other sort of incidental costs associated with the accommodation. Normally, most people are all right with that because the direct most most prominent direct cost is um, the rent and normally this is exempt so there's very little input VAT that is lost there but VAT is only then um, paid on the direct margin only and um, you can still recover VAT on overheads um, subject to the business's partial exemption position which we'll cover briefly um, in a bit um, but two drawbacks are that no VAT invoice can be issued to the customer um, so for business customers, it's not ideal. Um, and there's no reduction in the VAT rate for the long stay. So you don't get the 4% rate if you're constantly doing stays of longer than a month. So again, it doesn't work for everyone. Um, but it's all about finding the, the most optimal position for you. Um, a, a sort of comparison, um, and it, in a sense, I suppose you've got here annual turnover, let's say it's 120,000. Um, and the cost of rent is 78,000. There's no incidental costs here. So what we've got here is um, under the normal rules, um, we're paying 20,000 pounds in output VAT. Um, we're not recovering any input VAT because um, it's exempt. So there's no input VAT to recover. Under TOMS, um, we now have a, um, a direct margin of 42,000, which is just the 120 take away the 78. Um, which gives us fat, uh, which we carve out of the margin as margin times 20 over 120, which gives us output VAT paid of 7,000. Um, we can't really recover any input VAT under TOMS um, because there's no input VAT to recover, but also because it's blocked under TOMS, um, which basically gives us a, a sort of net payment to HMRC of the 7,000 still. So that's a significant saving. Now, this example is actually based on a fairly real life uh, um, scenario. So it's actually, um, it, it's not completely crazy that you could actually get this much of an advantage from using TOMS. But the key thing is to make sure it actually works and there's no risk attached to it. So do get in touch with us if you're planning to use TOMS because I'd really not suggest that um, you decide to do it without any expert advice. Um, we have seen the downside where HMRC disagree and it can be quite painful. So it's a risk that I wouldn't advise taking without the, the appropriate advice. Um, yeah, if you don't fall within TOMS and want to, there's various things that you could consider doing. Um, many businesses where there is a, um, where it's appropriate to, to have another company and in some circumstances, businesses um, have accommodation supplies that have to go through a couple of companies. In that case, it's possible to get TOMS to, um, to be a good deal. Um, but as I said, it doesn't apply in all cases, so please do take advice. And yet, TOMS in, in certain circumstances isn't optimal. So if you're mainly supplying to businesses, because the business isn't able to receive a VAT invoice from you or recover the VAT themselves, it can actually be a disadvantage for them. Um, so that's a consideration. Also, if you have a lot of long stays, so you're constantly selling to contractors or other people for 
three to six months plus, um, you may then be losing out on the 4% rate um, and potentially some recovery of that on the incidental costs. Um, so that may not work for you. Or if you're charged that on your accommodation purchase, um, so you buy that from someone, buy, you buy accommodation from someone on a short term basis anyway, they're charging that to you um, instead of having an exempt rent um, from someone. Then again, Tom's doesn't really do anything to help. So in terms of um, input VAT and purchases, we looked through the, um, the sales and output VAT position um, that can apply to service um, accommodation operators. And now I have a look at the input VAT. So in order to register, in order to recover input VAT, um, firstly, you obviously must be VAT registered um, and the purchase must relate to a taxable supply. And this is the point we discussed earlier about the difference between residential and tourist accommodation. We have some businesses that only supply residential um, accommodation. That's sort of a fairly easy VAT position and that there's no VAT registration um, required. You can't recover any input VAT. That's kind of it. Um, we have some businesses that only sell taxable services, which is everything else. Tom's, short stays, normal stays. Maybe they also um, do some properties as a managing agent and earn a fee or a commission as agent. That's all taxable um, areas. So the purchase has to relate to a taxable supply in order to recover any input of that on the purchase. Um, you must yourself receive and use the purchase. So if you pay for something on behalf of someone else, you can't recover the input of that because it's not yours. Um, you must have a valid VAT invoice and you must not have um, input VAT, which is specifically blocked. So, for example, as we mentioned, the Tom's um, Tom's direct costs specifically blocked. There's various other areas, too. So one thing we're alluding to here is that where we've got a mixture of services in a business and some are taxable, some are exempt. So maybe you have some sales um, which are short term service departments and other sales which are long term AST residential contracts, which is fairly common. We deal with a lot of businesses with which have these two types of, of properties um, fairly regularly. In this situation, the business is what's called partly exempt. Um, we have the difference then in, in how we account for the input VAT um, and we have to make sure that we um, account for input VAT appropriately. So any input VAT that relates fully to a taxable supply is fully recoverable. So an example may be um, commissions paid to booking.com, Airbnb or any other um, marketing site um, in a similar way that is, is purely for the short term accommodation. That may be completely like wholly to do with um, the short term properties, nothing to do with the AST contracts. That's fully recoverable. You may then have input that relating to exempt supplies. So maybe you get someone you have you pay an agent to manage um, some of your residential properties um, and they charge you VAT on their fee. In that case, that input VAT is fully irrecoverable. It's blocked from recovery because it only relates to an exempt supply. But then you'll have, I'm sure, um, quite a fair few other costs in your business that relate to both. So overheads of the business, for example, your professional fees, accountancy costs, um, office costs, et cetera, um, which you can't say this only relates to taxable stuff or only relates to exempt stuff. And what we do here is we portion the input VAT out. We have to do that uh, and block some of the input VAT. Um, so an example is as follows. Let's say our partial exemption percentage um, in the year or the quarter is 98%. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit, but um, let's for argument's sake just say it's 98% for the time being. Um, input VAT um, only relating to exempt sales is 10 grand. Input VAT relating only to taxable sales is 100 grand. And input VAT relating to both exempt and taxable sales, red, uh, residual input VAT is 50 grand. So now we look at what of this input VAT is recoverable. We can't recover any of the 10,000 relating to exempt sales and we can recover all of the 100,000 relating to taxable sales. Um, and in terms of then our residual input VAT, we can only recover the proportion of this um, as per our partial exemption percentage. 
So if we're 98% recoverable, then our out of our 50,000, we can recover 49,000. There's a restriction there overall of 11,000, being the 10,000 relating to exempt sales and 1,000, um, which comes off our residual pot. So um, what we're actually, how we're actually getting our partial exemption percentage is there's a number of ways, but the default way is to use the standard method. And we normally sort of, for, for businesses that we deal with, unless there's a sort of a, a big amount of um, restriction and we think it's unfair um, for the use, we would normally use the default method. Um, otherwise, there's plenty of other ways you can do um, this partial exemption apportionment. Um, and it does is something that you have to apply to HMRC for um, and normally do a bit of work behind. So if it's only going to make, you know, a couple of hundred pounds difference each year, then it's probably not worth Putting the effort in but if we're looking at substantial amounts then yes of course we'd want to have a look to try and get the best percentage uh, in use so all we normally do is um let's say in a year we've got a million pounds of tourist accommodation and we've got 50 grand's worth of exempt accommodation we've got total sales of a million and fifty thousand a partial exempt a uh, partial exemption percentage is just um, the amount of taxable sales over total sales. So in this case, a million over a million and 50,000 is 96%. And it's at 96% that we would times our um, residual input VAT by to get full recovery. We do have to um, do an adjustment once a year. So this is, we do this every quarter. Um, and then at the end of the year, um, we have a part exemption year always ends in March, April or May. So for the next quarter, the June, July or August quarter, um, we would have to then compare what we recovered in the quarter um, to what we should have recovered if we'd taken the entire year as a uh, sort of um, one single percentage, what the difference is. Um, it's basically an anti-avoidance measure by HMRC. Um, often it makes very little difference, but um, it is something that we are required uh, to do. So, um, so yes, that, that still needs to be done. Um, following on from this um, is what's called the capital goods scheme. Um, and this is quite relevant to anyone in the sector who has um, incurred capital expenditure on a property where the expenditure is more than 250k. Um, and what it means is that um, it won't apply in all cases. We'll, we'll always advise our clients on if they have any capital goods scheme expenditure um, that they need to consider. Um, but it's basically, it's another anti-avoidance measure. And it's basically HMRC saying, if you recover input VAT in full on a property, um, when you first either bought it or first refurbished it, you need to consider the use over a 10 year period. So let's say you bought property and decided, okay, we're gonna only rent it out on a short-term basis to um, guests for, for weekly stays. And you recovered all the money that you spent on the refurbishment, let's say, um, the per purchase sometimes as well, um, you recovered it all. And then let's say sort of somewhere down the line, you sort of think, okay, actually I'm just gonna let it out um, as an AST. Let's baby say a few years later. Then you've recovered all this input that on, you know, loads and loads of thousands of pounds and then, after a few years, you've just decided to use it for an exempt purpose. So what HMRC say is we need to assess it for a 10 year period. And if you decide at some point to change the use of the property, you may have to pay some money back to HMRC. Or in other cases, if the opposite was true, you may have to um, get some back from HMRC. So if we look at this as an example, um, let's say we've got a major property extension going on. Um, we it was 350 grand, so over the 250k threshold, and we had 40,000 of that. You expected to be letting it as tourist accommodation at first, so you recovered the 40k in full. So that's absolutely fine. Um, so recover 40k. So we sort of attribute a tenth of that to each of the next 10 years, and we say, right, in this particular year, year one, we had 100% taxable use, it was only let as tourist accommodation don't have to pay anything back to HMRC, all fine. Now in year five, um, we had a couple of um, residential lets in years four to five, and years nine to 10. So we had um, a reduction in taxable use in year five, and let's say we only used 70% of the income was for taxable short-term stays. So we have to pay back 30% of our input VAT. Now we've attributed um, 
the the 10th of that, the 4K to year five, so we're paying back to HMRC 1200. The same is true of year six. So we evaluate each year in turn in this kind of 10, 10 one tenth slot uh, for the end of our 10 years. Um, that needs to be done the quarter after the partial exemption adjustment. Um, and um, and yeah, after 10 years, you're sort of free to do what you like with the property. Um, you could choose to let it out completely as ASTs and, and not get an input of that clawback. Um, but that's essentially how it works. And um, it does need to be considered. It's something that doesn't not everyone um, does consider uh, along with the partial exemption calculations. But it is something that is really important. And some some cases that we've seen HMRC um, clamp down on. Um, I think they're starting to clamp, clamp down quite a lot in this sector just because it is quite new and, and up and coming. And HMRC are trying to to close loopholes. So they do be aware. So I think in summary, um, input VAT, we want to make sure that it's maximised. Um, there's various ways to, to do that. We do need to make sure that we comply with the regulations. So we need to, to assess um, partial exemption and capital goods scheme. Um, and we also want to make sure that input VAT is maximised for you. Um, so little things like making sure all your VAT invoices are there um, is, is a really good thing to, to sort of get into practice of early. Um, as a sort of final point, I um, just want to talk a little bit about VAT reliefs. Um, as we've sort of said, input VAT incurred on purchases relating to exempt supplies isn't recoverable. So there are some VAT reliefs um, that you may want to just be aware of. Um, so the zero rate um, replies to then some purchases incurred in the course of converting a non-residential property to a residential property and also the first sale or long lease of a residential property. Um, so this means that obviously with the zero rating um, of, of these things, there's no input VAT to, um, to have to pay in the first place. Um, the reduced rate of VAT also applies to um, certain purchases in the course of certain residential conversions, including changes in the number of dwellings. So that change in the number of dwellings could be if you've got two two separate apartments that you're converting into one um, or one apartment that you're splitting into three separate apartments um, and also to renovations and alterations of empty residential properties. These are things that need to be looked at into a lot more detail but I think for this particular presentation it's just having an awareness that these are out there. Um, all of these things are a lot easier to deal with if you look at them before any major purchases or um, activities. Um, if we're looking at things afterwards it's always a little bit more complex and in many cases an answer that could have originally been yes has to be a no um so anything like this please do take advice um as early as possible um to make sure that the VAT position um is the best it can be um so yeah i think the um the other thing to note is that a lot of these reliefs will apply to things like um, building services and materials, but professional services such as architects and surveyors are almost always standard rated. So um, please do bear that in mind um, when you're planning. Um, so that's kind of it for, for a sort of brief overview of service department operators, the VAT considerations for sales and purchases, um, your input and output of that. Um, we do obviously have to um, put a disclaimer in um in that um we we can't we can only advise generally here we can't um that is it is complex as you've probably seen from this presentation there's so many variables um that we can't um ask for this to be used as um specific advice for your situation if you would like specific advice please do let us know we do offer one-off consultations as well as obviously everything up to full projects so we're always very happy to help we'd always recommend that you take advice specific to your circumstances rather than then rely on general stuff in the internet. Um, I think this is really for awareness and to give you a taster of what can be done for service departments um, rather than for you to look at and think, that's great, that's everything I need, job done. Um, I'm never, ever going to look at that um, again. So, yeah, I think I hope that was useful. Um, we're hoping, obviously, to um, increase our YouTube channel. Um, so please do check back. Um, hopefully, in the next few months, we'll have um, reported on a number of extra topics. Um, but if you need anything in the meantime, um, please do give us a shout. Thanks very much for watching.